Hello and welcome to the Catholic Bookworm. I'm Kiki Latimer, your host this morning. And we have with us today Lisa Lacona. I'm very happy to have her with us um, to discuss her chapter in the second volume of um, sexual clerical sexual misconduct. And we'll talk a little bit more about the title um, in a second. But Lisa, you want to just start us off with a prayer? I'd love to. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Maria Goretti, pray for us. St. Mary Magdalene, pray for us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the title of Lisa's chapter in the second volume is Discovering the Gaze of the Virgin, Facing the Impact of Clerical Sexual Abuse on Women's Capacity for Spiritual and Physical Motherhood. Um, and before we get started, um, for those of you that haven't watched um, the other interviews on this book, I, I just want to say that we, we understand that this is a, a terribly painful topic for many people, um, for some people um, directly so, um, for others indirectly through family members or friends um, who have been hurt, um, both men and women, um, by the clerical sexual abuse. Um, and also for priests, the good priests that, you know, have been hurt by it um, and treated badly also because of it. So we, I just want to acknowledge that before we get started, um, that we know this is, is a very difficult topic. Um, I even hesitated when I was first asked to do the interviews. I was like, no, no, thanks. I'm good. Um, but I realized the importance of it. Um, that we talk about it um, and find ways to both heal from it and find ways to make sure that it never happens again. It's, it's of course, the hope. Um, so with that little introduction, Lisa, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, how you got yourself into this. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so my name is Lisa Lacona. I live in Rochester, New York. And I teach at St. Bernard School of Theology and Ministry. I'm a professor of systematic, assistant professor of systematic theology here. Um, I, uh, many years ago, went to the Pope John Paul II Institute and got my master's in theological studies and my licentiate in sacred theology. Um, for a while, was publishing and doing conference talks and then kind of went underground for about 20 years with uh, having a big family. And only in the last few years got back into the academy and teaching theology, which has been an amazing experience for me. But um, so, yeah, I have this kind of unusual CV for a professor, I think. <laughs> so you're in Rochester. Are you from yeah. Rochester originally? Oh, I'm originally from Ligonier, Pennsylvania, which is southwestern Pennsylvania. It's near um, St. Vincent Arch Abbey might be a place that people have heard of that's over there. So you've grown up with a lot of snow. Yes. <laughs> and the Steelers. It's Steeler. If you know the Pittsburgh Steelers, that's that's what we're known for where I came from. So. <laughs> what is it? Snow. Okay. <laughs> I lived in Utica for a while and, and my husband. Oh, sister. yeah. So, uh, yeah, we grew up with snow. So I was really excited to read. I, I just got a chance to read um, this chapter in volume two um, yesterday. And um, it has a lot of really wonderful um, concepts in it, this idea of, of the virginal gaze. Um, I've always struggled um, with the ideas about Maria Goretti um, mm. because it seemed like, you know, there was so much emphasis um you know, that, sh that she would lose her purity, you know, and it always seems to me, I used to always say that, um, well, why does the person rape to lose their purity? Isn't it the rapist who loses their purity? And you were quite honestly the first person who's ever brought out in anything that I've read that her concern was his purity. Um, and yeah. that fascinated me I, very much so. So I, at some point I want to, I want to, dig into that more but tell us a little bit about what you mean in the first place by the virginal gaze okay well well maybe the best there's a lot to say here 
I think the best thing to do is start with how I, how I kind of got into this <laughs> at all. I had done talks at a few conferences, a few conference papers years and years ago uh, on the, the mo- on motherhood in Pope John Paul II. So his idea of the mother, um, the woman's genius, right? The feminine genius that the, the woman has a particular capacity for seeing the person that's developed in motherhood, both spiritual and physical motherhood. And that, that um, that's her, her, her brilliant gift, her genius, right? And it's only in Christianity that we come to really appreciate what a gift that is to the world, this capacity to really see the other, to really look at another person and, and love them. Um, like John Paul II has this idea of the, of the mother's smile kind of awakening the child to reality itself, right? So there's something very profound, ontologically, philosophically profound about the feminine gift. And so I'd spoken about this, and when this project emerged, um, Jane Adolph, who's one of the editors, I had actually she had actually invited me to a few of these conferences. So she remembered that I'd done this work, and she said, "Could you do something for this volume?" And so it was interesting. I thought, "Oh, I'll just go back and you know rehash what I did." And this was you know twenty five years ago. We always and- think we can do that. <laughs> Pardon. We always think we can do that. Yeah, no, you can't, you can't do it. You can't ever do that. So I started thinking, oh, I'll just do Pope John Paul II. And then what happened was I had this, you know, between then and now I've had all these children. I have all of my daughters. I have five daughters. They're all grown up daughters, right? They're all adults now. The youngest is 19. And so I'm, I'm really starting to think about the, this issue that the, that's particularly addressed in this book, which is abuse of women by men, by priests in particular, you know, at a different kind of at a different level, I guess I'm thinking about it in a different way. And so there are two things that that precipitated me going into the the direction of this idea of virginity, which is doesn't seem like it's going to be match up with the motherhood piece, right? Very well. And that's, first of all, I, I had it, I did not at the time I was writing for a publication, editing a publication, I did an interview with a priest about his priestly ministry. And he talked about what he was doing with the kids in his ministry. And he takes these young people, eighth, ninth graders down to the March for Life. And in this, in he said, he loves this idea of talking to them about the pro-life issues, he said, because it opens up a, a way of discussing how they look at each other, how young men and women look at each other and how he said, because, you know, the pro-life issue begins with a baby that gets conceived, you know, and so it really begins with a man and woman and how they're interacting with each other. And this just, I don't know, this really blew me away at the time because I thought that's really true. It it really, these, these issues of um, a lot of these issues come down to something more fundamental. Like how do we relate to each other in a, in a, in a very fundamental way? And, this idea of how we look at each other touched me deeply because just in my life with my children, you know, like I was saying about the woman's, the mother's gaze upon the child, right? It's, it, it awakens them. I thought about how in my own life, it's being looked at and seen and appreciated and loved by others that really enables me to grow and, and, you know, go, go forward, mature as a human being and a Christian so this got me thinking, you know, maybe I have to go to, into this a whole different way. And then at the same time, I encountered this article as an academic article by Father Paolo Prosperi, who is, I, I, I cite in my chapter, and it was about this idea from Father Luigi Dasani on this notion of what he calls virginity. And he also call, talks about the virginal gaze. And he clearly was using this term virginity in a totally different way. <laughs> I'd ever heard of it. And yeah. it was that matching. Was I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. It was amazing to me. I mean, I know that in Theology of the Body, John Paul II, towards the very end of Theology of the Body, talks about being able to recover spiritual virginity, yes. which is one of my favorite things in it. Um, this idea that it's not just about, you know, a body part, that this is a whole bigger, beautiful view. Um, but your article even expands upon that idea or maybe digs into that idea. And, and it's beautiful because I think we are a culture. I mean, people listening to this right now, you hear virginity, you just think physical virginity, period. You know, you're just physically a virgin. She's physically a virgin. 
Um, we don't we don't even use the term really that much for men. A little bit, not within the church, we use celibacy, um, but it's primarily directed to women as a physical attribute. Um, but this concept is going way beyond a physical attribute. Yeah, to a spiritual, ontological, metaphysical, huge thing. Um, yeah, so yes. I just throw that in there. So, you know, this, this is expanding way beyond our cultural concept of what virginity is. Right. And, you know, that's, that's how Maria Goretti got into this, this <laughs> thing. I ended up, so my, my background, when I was uh, transitioning back into academic life, I worked for eight years as the editor for Saints at Magnificat. So what I did every day, I did all the writing on saints that you read in, in that, you know, in the Magnificat magazine. So I had to do 22 essays a month on saints. And it was, it was a very robust job in terms of, and I had to research everything. I had to find the saints. I had to research their lives. I had to write them, um, basically produce finished pieces of writing. So it's very demanding, um, incredible work. It just got me uh, grounded me in the lives of the saints as being, you know, the saints are these people that have lived, you know, our Christian experience, but you can kind of see it purified or, or clarified in them. And so as I got to thinking was, this was kind of the brainstorm for my whole work here was I loved this idea of virginity. And, um, but I also wanted to tie it with something that was concrete so in the article that that I wrote or in the chapter, I I explain virginity in Jasani, which is a it's a philosophical theological discussion. But then I also try to concretize it in these figures, so you got to get to start to get a sense of what am I talking about here? Mm-hmm. Um, and I could I could I don't know what would you like me to do? Would you like me to try to explain the Jasani? I get I feel like you know what's the best way to. <laughs> <laughs> um just go for it (laughs) go for it okay so well you know let me i'll start with the philosophy the philosophical theological concepts and i'm going to move to maria gretti because i think we'll talk for a long time about her and i think that's a really great i'm excited to talk about her because i've struggled with her story for years and your your writings yesterday were the first time anything made sense to me oh my god so i'm excited to talk about her yeah well let me just explain this kind of concept in a conceptual way. And then let's talk about Maria, because I think she makes it really clear for us what I'm talking about. So for Jasani, he he has two ways of discussing this idea of virginity. And he, um, Jasani, by the way, is the founder of this ecclesial movement called Communion and Liberation. It was you know, founded 60 years ago in Italy, now a worldwide movement. And he was a, it was a priest who worked um, primarily from the beginning in his priestly ministry with high school students. So he was really a person who was dealing with young people. And over time, he he developed a lot of his own language or his own way of describing completely classical Catholic concept, Catholic Christian concepts. But he liked to, I think part of, part of his gift was enabling young people to look at the faith in a brand new way. So he had ways of unpacking things that were not, con- maybe not conventional that helped them discover the wonder of the faith. It wasn't that same old thing that just got handed on to me and my parents and I know what they're talking about, but it's something they could see it anew. And so when um when he talks about virginity, he he talks about um he ta- he'll say it's a it's a love that is a possession with a detachment within. So that's a kind of sounds very abstract, but I think if what he means to say is that when we love someone, we we want we want to um, be united with them, right? We want to, there's a unity that's desired. That's the possession part, right? And if you think about possession, we mean like in the Song of Songs where it says, my beloved is mine and I am my beloved's, right? It's that love Love tries to be close to someone and to to embrace them, you know, maybe not physically, but, but desires that kind of union. But why a detachment within, and that's a classic term in Christian spirituality. And and by detachment, he means that you love the other without kind of grasping them or consuming them or using them, but you love them as they are, right? Let You let them be who they are in that love. And you're, so your love is a freeing love. 
And, um, you know, one of the best descriptions I've ever heard of this kind of love is in a little book by um, Joseph Ratzinger, that he, where he talks about Pope Benedict, of course, uh, where he talks about the um, fatherhood. And he says, you know, we have these extremes in fatherhood. And one is this kind of extreme of the tyrant father, like the father that's real possessive, like, you know, tells you what to do and controls your life. And the other extreme is the father who's very, um, who's detached, right? Just like a sperm donor, right? All all that that father is, is just someone who gets your life started and then he's out the door, right? And we have these weird extremes in modernity. We see a lot of examples of both of these extremes. And he said, you know, but but good fatherhood is, is that you love your child, but so that you let your child grow and be who they're meant to be, right? So it's a love that has is all the way in there with, I, I'm with you, I'm staying with you, I'm on this journey with you, son, but also I want you to be the fullness of the way God made you to be. So that's the, the possession is the desire to be close to the other and to be present to the other. And the detachment is, but I want you to be the way God made you to be. Yeah, the roots and wings we always talk about. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, see, so you got this. So I, you know, so we know this kind of love. If you if you've been in a healthy family situation, and you may even if you've been in unhealthy family situations, you've seen it, and you know, you know, you're like, there's something really right there, or you know, you experience it in a relationship with someone. And maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a mentor. You know, suddenly you realize that person just loves me for me. They don't love me. Um, for what I give to them or the way I make their life better. And um, so the other the other way he describes, Jasani describes virginity, and this is where I got the gaze part, is it's a way of looking at things in their truth. It's a, and it's, and it's, it's seeing reality, everything is the way God has made it to be. And that's a, to get to that point, we have to be transformed, right? Because we're sinners, we're, we're, um, we're liable to concupiscence, which is that desire that, gets kind of gets laid into uh, that, that lustful, I'm going to use that word lustful or um, misshapen, misdirected desires that, that kind of are, are the outcome or the, of original sin. Right. And the idea of virginity is looking at everything, not just starting with everything, the the way it is in itself, it's truthfulness, seeing things properly. Um, how they're how things are meant to be used, how things are meant to be appreciated. Um, and then when you finally bring that around to personal relationships, um, you start to see that this concept of, of this virginal gaze is pure gaze towards one another. Um, you bring out how that that has to continue in marriage for a marriage to to be good. You know, you you have to continue to look properly at your spouse. Um, so that it's not a matter of that you are having sexual activity or not, but it's a matter far bigger than that of how do we continue to look at one another? Um, and you know, oh yes, yeah, so you got it perfectly. That's right. John Paul starts to talk about this idea. You know, okay, so you like Mary Magdalene, so you've messed up in your life, or you've been messed up in your life by someone, um, but you you can get out of that. You can regain spiritual virginity. You can regain that proper gaze both towards yourself and towards others, but also, especially like you're saying for, for someone who's been hurt and abused by a priest or someone else or by yourself, um, that you can regain your, the proper gaze, the proper way of looking at things, starting with yourself. You know, you can put the right. You can yeah, put the it has to be the on yourself first and yes. you know, put yourself as the child of God, you know, and start with that. Yes. And I think that's where the connection starts to come with the topic that I was asked to write about for this, for this <laughs> book was, okay, how does abuse change the way we live, right? How, how, how does a woman, when a woman is is wounded very deeply wounded in that way how does it change the way she looks at her life and the the truth of abuse is it's the opposite of sexual abuse it's the opposite of that virginal gaze right instead of that person being seen and looked at and loved for their beauty and their giftedness which of course would mean chastity would be mean you know you you treat someone with utter respect 
um, you've gone in there, a person has gone and done something terrible, has, has, has hurt that person terribly and used them. And then that, of course, unleashes this really bad dynamic in a woman where she starts to see herself in the way she was seen by the abuser, right? And we see this in all these self um, harming, you know, and this is, this is, this is really what I see a lot of times as young people is self harm coming out of the fact that they can't see their own, they can't see themselves virginally, right? They only see themselves from within the, con within the context of wounds they've received. So um, it's a, to be abused, to be sexually abused. And we know this, you know, certainly see this in the testimonies of, of people that have suffered sex sexual abuse. It's, it's, it changes everything, it changes how you see yourself, how you live. It makes it very hard to come out of that. The, the thing about being seen virginally is that's a starting point for taking a step out of that abusive situation, right? Because suddenly somebody's looking at you and loving you just as Christ looked at Mary Magdalene, right? You know, we, like I say in my, in my chapter, we don't, you know, it, we, in the Bible, we have no idea what happened when Christ met Mary Magdalene. Um, I noticed when they did the chosen and when they made that series, so to they had to do series. that. <laughs> they, they went in there and they showed Christ meeting Mary Magdalene, which is very interesting. I felt, I felt like um, we're provoked to think about that. And they were provoked to think about that because this is a woman who's gone through a pretty dramatic change in her life, right? She is, we, we don't know, you know, she was, she gets, um, and I, this is so interesting when we had our conversations leading up to this book, um, a lot of people challenged me. We had some conversations that authors, we, we met together and people were challenging me on why, why are you using Mary Magdalene? You know, because in strictly speaking in the scriptures, it never says that she was a sexually abused woman. And, and that's true. And, and, and even Pope Francis has recently <laughs> emphasized that. Yeah. But she's a wounded woman, is what I want to say, because she's possessed. That that's what the scriptures say. And if you go into reading stories of possession, so fascinating. Exorcists will say, you know, most of these people are possessed not because they did something wrong, but because something was done to them. You know, they were abused, and that opened these incredible wounds in their spirit. Or you know, people even, I mean, it's awful, but people put curses on other people and it's just terrible things that pe things lead to possession. But so I started thinking, you know, well, it doesn't really matter if she, I shouldn't say it was, she was a wounded woman. She understands these wounds. Mary Magdalene was clearly, and that's why I think in the tradition, she gets put together with, um, with Mary, with that, that, that woman who comes right. and, and, um, the sinful woman and, cries on Jesus feet and anoints them right and dries his feet with her hair right that's why the tradition is put um kind of made that one person it may have been one person we don't know but that's but anyway Mary Magdalene she just was a person I've who spoken with um Father Paul here in Rhode Island he's our the exorcist for the diocese mm -hmm. and he has always said that he, he calls it the three portals to hell abuse addiction and abortion um, really that's amazing portals, three portals to hell um for demonic anything you know anything at those three things so you know there you have it you know abuse of any sort addiction of any sort and abortion you know just are you know just portals he calls them portals to hell that um, that's that's right in there that's exactly the, the point and that's so why mary magdalene you. was and anyone I know who's had demons of any sort, those three, one of the one or more of those three things are present in their life. Right. And that's, and that's why, so, so that's why thinking about that idea of like, okay, what changed in her? What, what, what was it that dramatically changed her life, you know, and made her go from this awful place to an incredible place, right? Because Mary Magdalene becomes almost like the paragon for women, right? She's, she stays with Jesus till the end. Um, she's, she's serving the disciples, but she's also in that amazing scene after the resurrection, you know, she's the first one that sees him. And then he sends her to, to preach the gospel, which is to me, it's a, you see this woman who's just, she's transformed, right? She's going to men, <laughs> right? This is the, this abused, you know, woman who's going to men and she's sharing, uh, the most beautiful thing ever with them. And, 
And so I got thinking about that. And, and this is a thing that another thing that Jasani actually talks about a lot in his, in his writings is how Christ looked at people and how it changed everything because he had this gaze of love and he had this way of being, he, he said, we have to assume he had this way of being with people because everybody that's around him, when they encounter him, all of a sudden their life is dramatically changed, right? Nicodemus, you know, and, or, or Zacchaeus in the tree, right? I want to have dinner at your house tonight. He gets right down, goes out, you know, if we take that seriously, we know that when you get, you are seen and loved by the son of God, who of course is seeing you with the eyes of the father, your life is going to be dramatically changed. And, and that's really, that's really where I think healing can begin for people. It's at this place of, you know, being seen and loved and wanted for who they are. Um, And we don't spend, you know, Mm -hmm. in this, these discussions about how to educate, educate young people, but also educate young men for the priesthood. I don't know that we spend nearly enough time thinking about cultivating this way of being and seeing the other and yet i think it's it's fundamental to the christian life if you think about people's experiences with saints i so many people will say this like that i met john paul ii i met john paul ii one time and he looked at me like i was i was the only person in the world well people will say that right like that's the gaze of christ on a person and imagine what it's like to be with someone like that for three years I didn't, in the lives of the saints, there's a lot of examples of people just really spending time being seen and being loved. Um, Margaret of Cortona, she, if I were writing this again, I would put her in there. She's a classic case of an abused woman, St. Margaret of Cortona. She was a medieval woman who was, um, who was a paramour. She basically, uh, she was rejected by her stepmother. It's almost like a modern story, right? She has, her father gets remarried. Her stepmother doesn't like her. She ends up leaving home early because she's rejected by her stepmother and she moves in with a man and he doesn't ever marry her, but just keeps her on, you know, and eventually he dies and she has this huge um, conversion in sorrow. And it's really a beautiful story. She spends three years living in a house really close to the Franciscan friary, just spending all her time praying and close to the Franciscan friars. And I, I see that. Okay. That's the, she's people, these men are seeing her like she's a, she, and loving her as a woman for who she really is. Like they're, they're not using her and she has to be healed of that experience of being abused. At the end of that time, she's becomes this huge spiritual mother. She's people start to glom onto her because she's got a great life of prayer. And she starts to start a minute. She starts a ministry to the poor. She's a great, another great example. But how does that change happen in a life? It happens because you were you were with people that saw you and loved you for who you were and were willing to just spend the time and and let that healing play out over time you know they didn't abandon you they 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 stuck with you through it through it all of that's got to be part of our approach to to sexual abuse in the church and and broadly speaking i want to throw into the pot here for especially for anyone who's listening who might be saying you know um, well, I've never been physically abused per se, um, but like myself, um, grew up or, or am living in a house full of pornography mm. um, or with a man who, you know, he's nice to me, but there's pornography. I'm surrounded by it. It's on the Internet. Um, and that that sends a message of abuse to women um, that, you know, unless you look like this perfect person, I don't value you. I value the women in the pornography in a certain way, um, which you will never measure up to. <laughs> um, and so that I want to throw that in, that that is clearly a form of sexual abuse, yes. even though it's not necessarily touching you physically. Um, it is a form of it that I think a lot of women are dealing with right now in, in marriages, in relationships. Um, they don't know how to come up against it. Um, and it is a form of addiction, um, primarily yes. for men. Women are immune to it, but it's primarily because they're more visually oriented and addiction that men are dealing with. Um, but it is a form of sexual abuse. It took me years to figure that out. You know, that I valued myself depending on what I looked like um, because that's what I grew up with. Um, so I just want to throw that into the conversation 
Yeah. Um, because I think it's important. You know, somebody may say, oh, yeah. you know, nobody's ever hurt me, but they have hurt me. <laughs> you know? Well, and that's why this concept of a gaze really captured me. Because you think about how you can be so hurt by somebody looking at you a certain way and kind of consistently. So I've been talking about that. Well, it's not beautiful. Margaret of Cortona, she's with the Franciscans and they see her and love her and want her as she is like God's daughter. And then you right. think about well, what if you're in a, a place where somebody's just looking at you as a sexual object or, or maybe even worse, you don't even measure up as a sexual object, like what you're talking about. Like you can't possibly measure up. And that's a, I agree with you. That's, that's all, that's really almost the source of, of abuse is that beginning, just looking at someone and seeing them for as, as something, you know, which is to be that you want to use, that you're going to use, right. You're, I I'm valuing you based on your usefulness to me, what, whether you can please me, whether you can turn me on. And I think that that's, um, I think you're absolutely right. And that's what, maybe that's like, that's another reason that this, this idea of looking at it in this way really was useful for me and helpful for me because I thought it really does start with a look. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, like you said, it's not a touch, it's a look. <laughs> and it starts that, like you're saying with this preset working with young people, it starts very early how we're taught to look at one another. Yes. Um, and um, how important it is to continue, you know, to get that early education. Yes. How do you how do you look at one another? Um, you know the the chosen you mentioned. You know Jonathan Rumi has captured this beautiful gaze, this virginal gaze, um, yes. with in in the in the filming of the chosen. It's it's just amazed all of us who have watched it. Um, you know. Oh my gosh! I have to say about that. <laughs> so about the chosen, <laughs> my my youngest is eleven. And we, two years ago, we started watching The Chosen together. And I wasn't sure I wanted to watch it because being theologically trained, I was a little bit thinking, well, what if I don't like how they do Jesus? You know, like I was having this really strong reaction. But I got, um, and there still are times when I watch it, oh, they should never have put these words in Jesus' mouth. But I, I agree with you. Jonathan Rumi is amazing. And, but this was the thing. The very beginning, they chose to have this section where Jesus is just out there on his own. He hasn't even called the disciples yet. And the children discover him. He's got his little encampment. And he, there's a, you know, there's kind of this episode where the children show up and, and he starts sewing, showing them his tools and stuff. And I watched that with my son and the way he reacted to how Jesus was with the children. He was squirming with delight. That it was so he and he said, Mom, look at the oh, way, look at all those kids <laughs> coming to see Jesus. And so I think you're right on, you know, and that's um that's a beautiful thing. I mean, that, that we're getting something, we're getting things like this out there that are helping us. Obviously, it also has to be I don't know if you've seen the sound of freedom yet. No, I haven't. I you know what just somebody sent me a text on the sound of freedom today. Oh my gosh, yeah. Heavy duty, but again, you have um well, it's played by the man from the Passion of the Christ. Um, Jim Cavizel. Yeah, Cavizel. Cavizel, as I say. Okay, great. Yeah. He plays the main character in it. And again, you have the difference between, I mean, he's, he's trying to go after, find these two kids who've been sold into sexual slavery in our time, you know. And you really see his gate, this virginal gaze of love he has for the children compared to the gaze of lust of the system he's trying to rescue them from, mm -hmm. um, you know, of, of really horrible people hurting little children. And you see the difference in the gaze. And right. I, I just thought, you know, that his look when he, you know, when he finds the children um, is so beautiful and he has five children or six children, at least of his own. Um, but the actor, Jim Caviezel certainly brought out, what you're talking about of how we look at people you know right. whether we look at them as persons or as objects right um, and when once you that inner gaze starts to very quickly determine what your outer actions are towards people yes and you know it's interesting for this for this piece because i was doing something that was primarily theological it doesn't i didn't get to 
the point of outlining like what are the practical ways to bring the virginal gaze forward but i do think that one of the the things is what you've already brought out which is how we look at ourselves it's okay and and um i think that there is a possibility in a in a person who's not not children but when we are adults even if we've suffered from different forms of abuse i think there is a, a possibility of of taking the time to start to think about you know essentially having the affection for ourselves that god has for us like that we have the we have the right to start to look at ourselves as children of god and and that's a that's something that's very practical and people talk about self-care and sometimes I think Catholics will say, oh, well, that's selfish, but there's a way in which God really does. He wants us to um, experience his love concretely. <laughs> and that means if you think of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yes. So it starts with knowing, well, how would I want someone to do unto me? Exactly. Exactly. And, and if I don't even do unto myself well and yes. think well of myself, that I'm precious in the eyes of God, how can I possibly treat you as if you're precious yes. when I'm not precious? You know, my highest understanding of a person is my my self-understanding to start yes. with. Um, so how could I treat someone else badly if I'm treating myself badly? You know, that yes. old the oxygen mask on yourself isn't selfish. It's I can only help you if I've put the oxygen mask on myself first. Yes, and there's like a, a spectrum of ways to look at this. I I just this is striking me as as you're saying this this morning at mass. The pre I'm going to this mass and the priest has been intermittently reading things from the diary of Saint Faustina, which I haven't read her diary. But one of the readings this morning was you know, just a morning she has in prayer and she just says, oh, this, all this whole prayer was just me being loved by Jesus, just being loved. And I thought, what a great witness. Like, it's okay to just need to have, you know, I'm going to go and be loved for a while, just be loved. I mean, if, if Jesus can do this with St. Faustina, then it's all, you know, it's all good to everyone, right? Because this is what he wants. He wants everybody to have that gaze, to, to be seen and, and, and appreciated and, and, and that the preciousness of our, of our person to be valued. So I think that that's, that's a starting, to me, that's the starting point to take that time in our lives to take time with our families to just be present to the other, you know, mother Teresa would say this, it all starts with how you're with your family, right? That, you know, do you love these people at home? And that's that, that love is just, do, how do I look at them? Do I, do I give, do I give them time? Do I let them be who they are? Um, there's one other way I, and I do want to, I don't, I hope we can get to talk about Maria Gretti because we've, we've been building up to Maria Gretti or so. So, but I want to say there's one other way that um, Father Dasani discusses virginity. That's how it really helped me. He's, he'll talk about, it's a, a belonging that makes possible freedom. So if you think about belonging to a family or you think a good fit in a good family you feel a strong sense of, I have a place, I belong. I know that I'm wanted and loved and I'm, I'm embraced in this space, but also I get to be who I am. I don't have to hide myself. I don't have to. And, and I think that that idea helps when we're thinking about raising our children and that parents, we often talk about, you know, that drama of freedom with children and they get to be a certain point and get to be a certain age. And it seems like it gets younger and younger where they just want to assert themselves. Right. And you, we have to learn to let them be free in a lot of ways. And, and sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's a challenge because we want them to live the way, you know, uh, we did, but there's a real value to, yeah, you belong, you belong to me and ultimately you belong to Christ. I always say to my I don't always say this, but once in a while, I remember to say to my children, you know, who do you belong to? <laughs> you belong to Christ, right? Um, but but ultimately, to, to let them develop their gifts and talents and go in all different directions. And even sometimes when it scares us, because we have to, we there's always going to be a place where they push against 
our own personal edges and and trust and trust that that if we love and we give there's going to be beautiful things that come from that because the belonging has to be has to be primary it has to be first so you can't you can't do it the opposite way i think you can't and watching them make mistakes that you don't want them to make yes you know, we, but we learn from our mistakes and we exactly learn, and we usually rarely learn from other people's mistakes well so- reality is the greatest teacher this is what i always I, I, I think, and I see with my children is you can tell them don't do this or that. But then when they, oh, my oldest, when she first banged up the side of her car, it was so painful to me. You know, you just want to rush in and, and she did something, you know, every, everybody, everybody, as far as I'm concerned, when you first start driving, you have some, something that you, you know, do wrong because you've never done it before and cars are expensive and it's, it's good to learn that right off the bat, you know, like, yeah, you can't, there's, she just kind of went into our parking space wrong, you know, and smash and smash the side of her car against a fence. And, you know, was, was just not going too fast at what she was doing. And, and I thought, okay, well, this is, you got to learn to go slowly when there's a fence there. <laughs> but <laughs> the way you discover it is you have to pay for a car repair. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh gosh. So this Virginia, this this idea of detachment. Yeah. You know, we we tend to think of detachment in a negative terms, but in, in this article, you talk about the concept of positive detachment. I found it interesting. I do want to get to Maria Goretti, but you brought in that moment with Christ and Mary Magdalene after the resurrection where he says, Don't cling to me. Yes. Which again is another one of those little lines where I was like, what is that about? You know, like right. don't cling seriously no um but i can't remember the quote you had but it reminded me um oh you mentioned you can't appreciate a painting if your nose is right up to it so he was like back off a little so you can see the bigger picture here and i thought about um there's a line in kalyle gibran's um writings where he says the mountain to the climber is clearer from the plain the mm. line i've always loved and so i never put Jesus saying, don't cling to me in those, in that context before. Right. Is- well, I'll tell you one of my, my favorite things to do is to go in with the saints in those places where we're least comfortable. You know, that's hence Maria Gretti and Mary Magdalene. I like to, I want to try to understand them and see okay, well, what, what does this, go, what will this reveal to me if I, if I stay in this rather uncomfortable space with Mary Magdalene and, and Jesus. And I have the same feeling. In fact, if you look at the art, the tradition of art in of this moment, it's a famous moment. Um, Noli me tangere is the old Vulgate, but Noli me ten, tenere, you know, don't hold, don't hold on to me is the, the more modern Latin version. It's a little bit less clingy sounding because tangere has this sense of like kind of grasping hold of something. But still, the, the art has always got well, not always, but sometimes Christ looks like, you know, he's repulsed by her. And that that was hard for me because I I relate to Mary Magdalene in this moment of seeking this. <laughs> Let me at you. I, like, I don't want to lose hold of you. I don't, I lost you once already. Like, it just seems to me to be a natural moment. I thought, well, this can't really, he couldn't have been really repulsed by her at this moment. But so I wanted to go in there and, and re- reflect on that. What what is going on? Is he is he telling her don't don't hold on to me, or is he is he really he's he's really trying to teach her about the nature of love? He's trying to teach her that that love is certainly there's a moment for for that closeness, but also there's there's um there is this positive detachment, and it does enable you to see the other as they are. And for a person who is called to celibacy to actual virginity, you know, of a person who is going to make those vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience, um, that's going to be the way their, their life is always lived, right? They're not, they're not ever going to be able to like, um, attain unity with another person by grasping hold on them, keeping hold of them for, for a time. And so they have to go through that process of renunciation of, uh, and it's a positive process. It's a process. That's what, that's what I would want to emphasize it's the process of learning to love while letting the other be other and always just, you know, being willing to do that 
Jasani says at one point, it's it has to do um, in the life of, of a person who's called a celibacy with just right away um, preferring the opposite of of you know like you you see you know he says you see a blonde and you're like oh I'd really like to like get to know her you know and you have to you have to learn to say no you know I have to move a little bit away from that emotion that I had the immediate feeling he says the first feeling you have is I really want to flirt with that blonde right he says but when you do that when you start to move away from that first feeling and that's the renunciation or the detachment then you start to discover a deeper form of love that you're on the path to this virginal love and um and i think you see that in the lives of the saints you see that that's um this very uh profound love that you know somebody meets john paul ii and says i felt so loved well he's why is that because he's learned to practice this sort of love but that also has to be practiced in the family, right? There's, you know, we hold on to our children for a certain period of time, but then there's got to be this, let you it know, go. yeah, I got to let you go. And, um, and so there is it this is detachment loving here detachment. Too. It is a loving detachment. It's a loving detachment. You know, I'm reminded, I had a funny story when I was, when I was uh, still working at Holy Apostles before the pandemic, and I was at the lunch table one day, and one of the seminarians asked me, he said, you know, I, I just have a sort of a personal question. He said, um, what happens, he says, if like, I'm in a counseling in the future, I'm in the counseling situation with a woman, and like, she starts to like me too much, like she starts to form, you know, like a, a, you know, a flirtation type thing. He said, how would I know? Like, how would I know? And I said, oh, you would know from how she looks at you. And he says, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, like, trust me, you would know. And he said, I don't think I would know. And he said, I don't think I would know. So then the conversation changed and I waited about five minutes at the table. And then I looked at him differently. <laughs> I looked at him flirtatiously. Whatever yeah. it is you do with your eyes, I looked a little too long. Yeah. And he went, whoa. I mean, he, <laughs> he, went, wow. he just was like, oh my gosh. It's like unbelievable. And I right. said, see, I told you you would know the difference. Right. I said, that is amazing. You that's know? a great, that's a great story. <laughs> I think that's the kind he of education really probably didn't. we need. I, I was not looking at him as a friend or as a seminarian or as his professor. I was looking at him as a woman with sexual interest. And right. he instantly, with literally one second, was enough for him to just go, wow, wow. wow. You know, um, there is a deliberateness to gazing at people, yes. how we gaze, you know. Oh, I think um, that's a great, that's a great example. And that's the kind of education that we need to have be part of every, you know, everybody's education, right? Because that even married people have to learn how to look at people properly and not look at people. But certainly and for the someone- The second you see that, that's when you say, there's the door, you need to have a different counselor. <laughs> the nice but, knowing you. <laughs> right. But also I think, you know, here, I I feel like this is a, be, be a great, quite a fruitful conversation for me because it's it's provoking in me also- this desire to go in with more of the saints, because there are a number of saints that did, that had really fruitful ministries to prostitutes, ma male saints. So certainly they got in there and these women probably tried, 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 <laughs> tried you know, because that what if you're, if you're a woman who's suffered that much and you're so used to interacting with men in that way, you, you don't really have any other modality. So it'd be interesting to think about how do they stay in the game with these women? Like, and I think that there's, there's obviously going to be some very practical decisions that have to be made, but also, um, but also I think um, you have to be a really grounded priest to be able to do that. Um, exactly. Father Mariani here in Westerly, he's, he's an older retired priest now, but back in the day, 20 years ago, um, he was known for putting on his stole and heading to the beach for confessions. And he would, the kids would line up on the beach, bikini clad, and go to wow. confession on the beach. And he got a lot of flack um, from some quarters about that. It was like a priest doesn't belong on a beach with bikini clad women. And Father Ray's response was basically, well, bikini clad women are not my problem. I may have problems, but it's not bikini clad women and wow. teenagers. And, and it no. was beautiful.
the kids, they wouldn't get, to, he just said, I have to meet them where they are because they're not coming to me. Um, and from what I understand, I never actually saw it, but I heard from other teenagers that the kids would line up for confession on the beach. That's, that's fascinating. You know, and this is, I, I have to confess, this isn't something I've gone all the way in on. I, in fact, I just got a book recently that's on um, living celibacy and it has a whole chat. I just was um, paging through it. There's a whole chapter on what are the signs that someone is in love with you? So what you taught that seminarian, it has a chapter and has like a list of <laughs> look for these things. And I thought, well, there probably are people that, especially if you think about how many young people come out of dysfunctional or broken homes, you know, and they, maybe they've never seen like a, a healthy look of love between a man and a woman or they, or they've seen it, but it's not really been part of their upbringing. So they need to, somebody needs to walk them through some of this stuff, but there's something that occurs to me. And I think that, um, that the beauty of say the theology of the body and the work of John Paul II, which is kind of, it's at the, nestled in the center of this chapter that I wrote, because I do want I did want to bring that in and that look of love that man has for woman in the original state, right, is very much at the heart of John Paul II's theology of the body. The beauty of that is that it, it I think it's enabled us to begin a conversation about the fact that men and women, men and women are always going to see each other and they are going to be attracted to each other and women are going to be attracted to their confessors and confessors are going to be attracted to women that come to them. And, and I think that, 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 that honesty is important as well. A young man is going to get himself into trouble. Who's studying for the priesthood. If he thinks he's, he's, you know, if I, I could, I could just deny the fact that I'm ever going to be attracted to a woman. People get, people have attractions. Crushes happen to people. I, my oldest daughter, the first time she ever had a crush, she came to me in tears and was so upset because she couldn't make it go away. <laughs> and I said, well, honey, this is how crushes are. They, they kind of just happen to us. You don't, it will go away eventually, <laughs> but it, sorry, it's just, and, but it, they happen to everybody and they they happen through life. And, and this is where our maturity, maturity lies. Not that you don't see a beautiful, um, a, a priest sees a beautiful woman and recognizes she's a beautiful woman. And I could easily fall in love with her. And, and I'm feeling attracted to her. That's all got to be acknowledged. There are right. forms for that. Working on that in seminary formation more. Yes. That, you know, really dealing that just because you become a priest doesn't mean you're, you know, you just packed up your sexuality and it went away. Exactly. You know? um, but that it's part of your being. It's part of who you are. I remember when I got married, I thought, once you get married, you're never attracted to anyone again. Yeah, that's and uh, that was just, you know, it's like oh, ooh, you know, um, you know that that you know caused a huge amount of problems. Just having that that false idea, right? Um, so we definitely in seminary formation need to. I think a lot of young men go into seminary thinking, you know, once I'm ordained, that all just goes away, and it rather that you no, know, I have to, we'll have to. This will be a lifetime journey. Um, your second, you don't, your sexuality never goes away. It's just how you learn to work with it and deal with it and um, choose how you gaze on people. Yeah. How you gaze and how you gaze on yourself. Yes. You and that's why it's, how you gaze on yourself. yes, it's, it's such a, it's such a beautiful thing to think about it as being virginity as being a, a capacity for love of, of a different kind of love. And I love that in some ways, is, is is quite deep. And I think that this is great. I want to make my last plug for the saints here. You know, you see this in some of these saintly relationships. Very, this past semester with my students, we read these letters that St. Um, Francis de Sales wrote to St. Jane Francis de Chantal. And of course they were, uh, they were co-founders of, of the order of the visitation. And he he says he basically says I love you in this virginal way. He he's very concerned for her. He's her spiritual father, but he's very affectionate in his expressions. It's not it it. So what it shows is you can be affectionate in this in this context of a healthy relationship. And they certainly had a healthy relationship. Um, was, it, was there were there were clear boundaries in the sense that you know they were both professed religious and they they had they they knew that they had this 
connection to Christ as their fundamental reality. But at the same time, they could express affection toward each other that is quite beautiful. And I think it support, especially he supported her a lot. She was, she was going through many difficult times. And I think that's a beautiful model. It does require maturity and we've got to move towards maturity, but it, it doesn't mean that you, you, you become ordained and like you give up relating to women for the rest of your life. And, mm-hmm. and it's a beautiful model for those of us who are married to mm-hmm. look at other, you know, other married people, like you said, the attractions happen and, but to be able to look at the other and um, recognize their, their value and even, even show affection in, in healthy ways that, um, that you know, I was blessed other. to be at a seminary that had um, about 60 Vietnamese nuns there as well as the seminarians. And so these, these beautiful women were like everywhere and I thought this is like the perfect seminary because, you know, the guys are not like hidden away from women and they're not in an all male seminary. There's just women everywhere. So here, if, here, if anywhere, they're going to find out if this is the life for them. Yes. Um, because they interacted with women continuously. That's and great. That's such a great life experience. Wonderful. You know, there were female professors and there's, there's, you know, other students who were women and it was wonderful for them. Um, and you could really see that they had, they had just a much more of a normal life at the seminary because of the women that were present. Um, and, you know, they figured out very quickly whether they were more meant to be married than, than priests very quickly, you know, <laughs> uh, Oh, I love that. That's a really, that's a really, really great example of what we're talking about. That uh, that so Maria Goretti. I know we don't have too yeah. much more time. <laughs> Let's Maria. talk about Maria. Maria Goretti. I've always struggled with Maria Goretti. Yeah. Um, so it was wonderful to see a different viewpoint on the whole thing. So I'll let you. Well, let me let me just say that it's interesting. Um, when I brought up Maria Goretti in this piece. I wanted to understand, I wanted to find a way of explaining this idea of virginity. And I thought, well, I have to start with what people already think virginity is. And I think a lot of people think about physical integrity, right? She's a virgin. That means that she's, you know, she has this physical integrity, right? She's never had sexual intimacy. And, um, And then I thought, well, the church has already got this idea of virginity that that seems to have a spiritual dimension to it. And we talk about these virgin martyrs, right? So what is virginity in the virgin martyr? And Maria Goretti is really our, our most famous virgin martyr. She's a modern virgin martyr. And I thought I would tell her story as a way of helping us understand this, but um, also because her story provokes a lot of emotions in people. And I did at the time, a lot of searching on the internet and there's tons, there's slews of article articles out there um, by, by Christians and Catholics women who find her story and the fact that she was canonized as a virgin martyr, very challenging. And so I started reading some of that to to understand why were people, why are people challenged? And there were two interesting um, pieces um, and maybe actually, maybe I'll tell her story really quickly and then I'll explain what the challenge people had was. So uh, Maria Goretti was an um, Italian girl. She was 12 years old when she was attacked by um, a young man, Alessandro Serenelli, who was 19 at the time. Their families were living together in a shared house. They were very poor farmers and they had to band together to live together and Alessandro um, lived with his father and Maria lived with her mom and other siblings. And, and um, when he attacked her, um, he, he stabbed her multiple times and she fought him off successfully. And, and she fought him when he was trying to, to rape her. And then he eventually fled and was captured and she died the next day. So she died from these stab wounds, but she had, she was taken to the hospital and was able to confess and, 
And, um, and then ultimately she was canonized as a virgin martyr. Um, and in, I think it was 1950, I, I should have looked up the dates, but, and, but this was in the 19, 1910s when she was, she was um, attacked. And the, the, pro- oh, so, so that's the outlines of the story, the problems that people have. The, fir- the first problem that I would read about online was that, um, okay, so she fights off her attacker and this is supposed to be heroic, right? That she defended her virginity. And a lot of women would point out, well, every woman would do that. Like you get attacked by a rape, rapist. You're not going to be like, hey, I'll go with this, right? You, you, you don't want, nobody wants to be raped. So people have pointed out that, well, what's heroic about that? Like that's natural. That's, that's an interesting point. And then the second point that I think is a, goes to the heart of the issue is that, um, is that, is that when a person is raped, um, if you don't want to lose your virginity, you know, you, it hasn't as a, it, you have to want to give your virginity away for it to be a sin against purity. Right. So you're not impure because you got raped. Right. So it seems like there's, okay. So how, what's the story with Maria? Maybe that's your, was that your, that's always, you know, and I've seen that even in, in recent Catholic writings, um, the idea yes. that if, if she were raped, that she would be dirty. Right. You know, that she, so she didn't, she didn't want to allow herself to be dirtied. Right. And I used to always say like, he was the one that was dirtied by the rape. The rapist is dirtied by the rape, not the one raped. Exactly. Um, and and that's, it, my first sign of sort of a view into that was the, uh, was that I saw outside of that was John Paul II's Theology of the Body, where he talked yes. about the spiritual virginity. And I, I said like, there it is. It's right there. Like, so what if her physical virginity was hurt? Like she was still just as pure as ever. Yes. You know, it was his, vir- it was his filth and sin. And, you know, it, but it always seems to somehow, even in Catholic writings and by Catholic authors drift onto somehow the woman is made dirty by the rape, you know, exactly. she, and, and so that's always been, you know, that and the idea of, was it, worse for him to be a murderer than a rapist you know right had- <laughs> that's a good that's a yes so that's also been always my question like you know so he became a murderer instead um so i've always kind of questioned that no i um, think this is but, this goes to the heart of the issue. the first thing that's ever told me that she was concerned for his purity not for her own physical intactness um that that was that was set far secondary to his impurity that he could be committing a horrible sin that would damage his eternal salvation. And I had never seen that anywhere. So yesterday was like, Oh, finally, there it is. Well, well, let's talk about that maybe for just a minute, because there are these kind of three moments in her story that I think illumine the full meaning of virginity in her case. And the first one is that when he's attacking her, she says, no, don't do it, but not, no, don't do it. I'm going to go hell. She says, you'll go to hell. So she immediately, she's not like you're, you're sending me to hell. She's saying you're doing something that's imperiling your soul, which is, if you think about quite astounding in the moment of attack to be thinking of another person's soul, right? Instead of just like, I just don't want to, I don't want to die. She's thinking, I don't want you to die spiritually. That's so mature. And we know from the accounts of her life that she did, she was, um, she was, she was a spiritual prodigy in a way. She was quite attached to Christ already. This was, this is the heart of her virginity is her love for Jesus and her desire to be in union with him. And so that's where her virginal gaze comes from is this relationship to Christ. And she, she, ex, she exclaims in that moment, I don't want you to go into sin. And then the second moment is when she's dying in the hospital. The priest comes to give her her viaticum and he hears her confession. He asks her, which is quite a bold move on a priest's part. I think ask her if, he, if she forgives him, which I, I, and in that once again, an amazing moment for this young person that's dying of stab wounds. She says, yes, I forgive him. And I want him to be in paradise with me. So not just, I forgive him, but I want his true human good that he'll be in, in paradise with me. You know, so not only she, there's, there's a communion she desires with her rapists and murderer, right? Or would be rapist and murderer. 
And then the last piece was what happens to him after happens to Alessandro after the the crime. He gets captured, he gets convicted and sent to prison, a long prison sentence. And he's at first quite depressed. And then in prison, he has a vision, or it's a dream actually, but in the dream, a vision of, of Maria Goretti. And she's there in the dream and she's holding a white lily. And he wakes from this dream with this profound sense that he's been forgiven, like she has forgiven him. So you can imagine the depression that comes upon him because he's committed this terrible crime, the shame, the guilt. And then Maria comes and she looks at him with the virginal gaze again. And now the virginal gaze is, you know, I forgive you. So he's, his life changes in prison. He kind of becomes the model prisoner. He becomes very prayerful. He gets let out early, which I think was, you know, maybe it was like a 40 year sentence. And he gets out 35 years. It's a pretty, he's in prison for quite some time. But when he goes, leaves the prison, first thing he does is go to Maria's house to basically confess to her mother, like basically ask to her mother's forgiveness and to her mother grants him forgiveness. And then he be, he becomes um, uh, like a, a lay brother for the Capuchin friars and spends the rest of his life in this kind of prayerful existence and amazingly is is part of her canonization proceeding so how do we know what happened when the rape happened he tells the story okay this is what happened maria said this to me and and so that was the that was one of the things that amazingly she becomes a saint because the man that attacks her is the one who tells the story um and all of this i think points to this idea of virginity we've been talking about this whole time right this she her her relationship with Christ permitted her to really like to 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 go to a, come to a place where she could see him as God saw him both the horror of the sin but also um his destiny in heaven and his need for forgiveness this is really she's a beautiful sign of this full meaning of virginity and um, if you go back and read the Virgin Mar- stories of the Virgin Martyrs in the early church, they're they're often very um, fantastic sounding. They the, their accounts were very much elaborated by the early Christians, but I think at the heart of it is this idea that these women were they they want to live their lives with Christ as their their true spouse. That's the heart of virginity, and in the virginal gate, just it's like it's telling us, well, what does it mean that Christ is your true? Like they, that this person has taken hold of your life. You start to see each other see other people in a different way. It's the the fruit of Christian maturity, of, of growing in our lives with Christ. So just to come to all of these points about, about how do these, how does this get laid out or in people or how does the, this, is this born? I mean, there's, you know, it's the Christian life. It's a life of prayer. It's letting yourself be like adoration. I think of as like, that's the place where you let yourself be seen, right? <laughs> And start to work through <laughs> what, you know, all of your wounds and all of your difficulties, because Christ wants to see everyone like Maria is looking at Alessandro, right? Like he wants to forgive our sins. He wants us to be with him. He wants us to have a life that's full and rich and beautiful. So she's, I, I, as I, as I meditated on her, she seemed to be such a beautiful way into understanding this concept and, and putting it in con you know putting it in a context that people could hopefully understand and ha- and helps us understand this is oh, let me just see i want to make sure people get to see the book do you have the book handy yes, there yes i do <laughs> there so there's, two, there's two volumes yes um, clerical sexual misconduct one and two um the first one focuses much more on the abuse of of, of men and boys um, the second one, not exclusively, focuses more on the abuse of women, um, sadly, in the church. Um, I, I've read both of them. I highly recommend them. They are difficult. Um, but um, if you're involved, especially in ministry or if you've had you know anything like um, this in your family or life, I recommend them. Um, what I would like, and, and they're available on Enroot, Enroot Books and on Amazon. So um, they're there. I think it's time for your chapter to turn into a book. I'm going to throw oh, I, I hope. <laughs> Maybe you can um, pray for that. <laughs> and anybody who's watching, you know, I I have to say that this has been a fabulous conversation. I The lives of the saints kind of bubbled up in there. And a lot of 
um, things that could maybe be helpful for people. I think this is a particular of, I mean, I've read all of almost all of it. I've read all of volume one and good part of volume two. Um, I have to say there's been a few chapters here and there that I've really felt this needs to be a book by itself. Mm. Um, so that someone is not as encumbered to have to buy this whole big thing. But I think there's so much that came out even in this conversation in this hour um, that your chapter could expand into um, that it would be a wonderful a book in and of itself, The Virginal Gaze. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to encourage Thank you to you. think about that. It wouldn't Thank even you. have to be a big book. I mean, you don't have to write a tome. Um, and Root publishes a lot of wonderful smaller volumes. Um, but also you opened up for me um, new ideas, both about Mary Magdalene, especially the moment with Jesus saying, don't cling to me, um, that, that, that that change. And certainly the, the things we've talked about with Maria Goretti, um, people do have questions and issues and you know, incorrect concepts surrounding um, why she's considered a virgin martyr, why she's considered a saint um, that I think are important. Um, and then the whole view, the whole concept of, of developing the virginal gaze, starting in families, um, and, you know, if you've come through abuse or you're in abuse or you've come through it and you want to, like, find ways to start over, <laughs> as yes. John says, that you can seek this, this, this spiritual virginity, that you can begin to gaze both at yourself to begin with and then others with this virginal gaze. I, I think it's important. It'd be nice to be able to hand people a nice little book with just that. Well, yeah. you're inspiring me. <laughs> Uh, Truly, I I really thank you so much. I'm I'm I mean, going to take this I totally. Many, I mean, you've got wait your article's probably what maybe 10, 20 pages, so a nice That's little hundred page, <laughs> a nice little hundred page you know seventy five page book with with all of this like nice neatly compact it would be wonderful. Yeah, I'm sure oh, Sebastian I'm for that. Is. <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to add to this that we've missed or? Gosh, no, I, I'm, I'm truly grateful for this opportunity. It's, um, this is very close to my heart and, and your Kiki, your understanding and appreciation of, of my articles is beautiful for me. And, um, so I'm, I'm, this has really been a great experience and, um, I don't, I, I'm, I welcome, I don't know if you can put my contact information up, but I certainly welcome people reaching out and discussing this. I've had some, I, I did give this chapter as a, as a lecture when I first got my um, position here at St. Bernard's and um, just locally, a lot of interest in this concept and people want, wanting to share it. So I'm happy to, to tell us your contact information and then I'll have. Sure. Sure. Um, my email is lisa.licona, that's L-I-C-K-O-N-A, at St. Bernard's, so that's just S-T-B-E-R-N-A-R-D-S dot E-D-U. And you can just email me there and um, I'll get it and I'll respond. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. All right. You want to end us with a prayer? Sure. What if we, I, what if we pray the memoir? I love to end my classes with memorari. So I'll do that in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored the help, or sought the intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but on thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's kind of like Mary's gaze upon us, right? That's the ultimate virginal gaze there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll be in touch and get that book written. Thank you. <laughs> All right. God bless. Bye-bye.